Welcome to So Much Potential. In this video, I share many of the native plants I'm planning to sow in 2023. Spend some time with me and explore 90 different native plants that are likely to be totally new to you. Grab a beverage and curl up next to my fireplace for the next hour and look at all of these cool plants. Okay, so I've got my fire going. My tea, I have tea this evening. It's almost gone, I might have to make some more. Thought we would start with a group that might be familiar, the milkweeds. This purple milkweed uh, is a lot like common wolf milkweed. Um, it looks very much the same, uh, except that it's a deeper purple flower, whereas the common milkweed is a really light uh, purple or sort of mauve color. Um, they bloom about the same time, they're about the same height. This is a little less aggressive than the common milkweed, uh, and it likes, maybe tolerates shade a little bit better. Now we're talking about just a little bit of shade. Um, so it tolerates that just a little bit. Uh, it's also, look at that, it's such a lovely color. This world milkweed uh, is similar in height to the orange butterfly weed. Um, so a little shorter, they're about two feet. Uh, this has white flowers, whereas the orange butterfly weed has orange flowers. This one, like the uh, butterfly weed, also likes dry conditions uh, and full sun, tolerating a little bit of shade. And I pulled the dogbane because it is in a similar overarching family and they do look very similar to milkweed. Again, about the same height as common milkweed. The flowers are a bit more open and less conspicuous, and it's a bit taller, maybe averaging on the higher side, on the taller side of um, common milkweed, which is usually around three to four feet. Um, dogbane is more like four to five feet, so it's a little taller. Dogbane is not a host plant for um, the monarch, but it does host other caterpillars. So it is uh, still a good one to have. Dogbane, uh, I got particularly because I want to try using it as a fiber plant for weaving and making cordage. Um, milkweed is apparently good for that too. We'll see. This is supposed to be really good though. Uh, I figured I would start with something um, that is locally native uh, to me, uh, native to much of the United States that many of you might recognize more in a family that will seem familiar to most people. Uh, so these are both goldenrods. Neither are your average um, Canada goldenrod. Uh, they're both uh, locally native to me. Um, and they both have these sort of flower clusters that um, group along the stem. Uh, this one too groups along the stem. This one actually reminds me a little bit of a forsythia. The, the branching habit is kind of curved and wide, whereas this one, uh, as you can see in this picture, they have sort of more straight stalks that go up. Um, very different looking goldenrods, these. And this one doesn't really like full sun, um, so it needs a little bit of shade, um, but it is, if I flip this over, it is a little bit more tolerant of dry conditions. I wanted to add these to my collection. Okay, kind of an interesting pairing here. Um, I got three different kinds of pussy toes. Neglecta, Plantagenifolia, and Parlins. They all vary a little bit. Uh, they all bloom around, around about the same time, that being uh, April to June. Uh, and they're all about the same height low. So this is the shortest one, getting about four inches tall. Uh, and these two stay basically around a foot once they're flowering. Okay. And they all like the same conditions. So planting these all together is a really good idea. Uh, you get a little bit of variety among them. Um, they also will um, take a little foot traffic. So I'm planning on putting these sort of near a path. If they get stepped on, it won't be the end of the world. They also all have this sort of silvery foliage due to the hair, little hairs on them. 
so they have really interesting texture even when they're not blooming uh, and they all have basil flowers so they have a group of like basil flowers they all have basil leaves so they have a group of leaves at the bottom of the plant that stay along the ground um, nice and low so this is a really nice low plant you can sort of see that a little bit in this picture and i pulled also one you might be familiar with this pearly everlasting uh, which is not related um, but it does look very similar same sort of silvery foliage, uh, similar kind of flower, and it likes the same kind of conditions. So if I flip this over, we've got full sun and a little bit of shade, and on the drier spectrum, it is taller, this one, at about two feet. I do plan on putting these somewhere, a small grouping of these together, because I think that'll look interesting. Um, but also it's kind of nice if you just to sort of add uh, if you've got some of these sort of low and then in a, another spot in your garden where you can still sort of see it, um, these that are taller, sort of more towards the back, it'd be a nice uh, sort of drift look with some variety. Anyway, food for thought. Uh, Pearly Ever Pearly Everlasting is one that you'll find commonly grown for cut flowers uh, and dried flowers. So this is one that you may be familiar with. Uh, and all of these are locally native to me. Early and late horse gentian. These two are both new to me. I came across them because I was looking for uh, plants that would do well in dry shade, because I have that and I wanna put some plants there. It's hard to get, it's hard for me to get a good feel for what they look like. Um, they seem like single stalks with very wide leaves uh, and their flowers aren't very prominent. They're sort of in along the stem um, for a small portion of time in the spring. And they're well known for their berries. So their berries are strikingly colored. The early one are uh, red and the late is orange. Uh, and I'm interested to see what those are like. Uh, I have a need for plants. These are both locally native to me. And so I'm exploring something I am not familiar with and that's fantastic. Uh, apparently it's also, these are called um, also wild coffee because their seeds look like coffee beans. So that's fun. Showy, sisal leaf and pointed leaf tick trefoil. So these are the tick trefoils I have, um, desmodiums. This one I got to germinate some of last year, which was excellent. Uh, it is a tall prairie looking plant so it's a single stalk up the middle um, with this wild giant bush of um, pink flowers on the top of it. These are all legumes. Uh, so the flowers all look a little bit like legumes, as do the leaves. Um, and they're, they do for the soil um, what legumes do. Fix nitrogen and all. Anyway, um, so I've got some of this. I'm going to plant some more. This uh, showy tick trefoil. This one is new to me. Um, it likes the same conditions, sunny, dry. It looks very much like a uh, prairie plant. Um, this one though, I, I can't really get a good handle on what it looks like. There aren't a whole lot of great pictures of what the entire plant looks like on the internet. Um, it is shorter, so this is about four feet high and this one is like five or six feet high. So I figured they'll look nice together. Um, as far as I can tell, the leaves on this are small and the flowers on this are small, but it is a very big plant. It looks sort of bushy and like a lot of stems. So we'll see what that looks like. And this is and in the same family, really except it flowers, is a is shade kind of loving nice. plant. Um, in shady, dry conditions, you don't get a lot of pink flowers. So that should stand out in my uh, shady, dry garden. Some more legumes. Uh, this one, this partridge pea, looks very familiar if you're used to growing legumes or even um, trying to get rid of vetch, <laughs> which is also a legume, uh, not a native here in the United States. Um, but this partridge pea uh, is an annual. So I'm gonna try out using an annual. Sun, a little shade, um, a little bit more on the dry, medium to dry end of things, and about two feet tall. Um, kind of shrubby looking. I'm gonna try that this one out. 
uh, actually in the veg garden in addition to maybe some other spots. Um, this goat's rue is about the same size, maybe a little shorter, but it looks similar. You can see the similar um, pea style leaves uh, and uh, flowers. This has really striking color, um, which I'm excited about. This wild senna, um, I have one or two already. I'm gonna try to germinate some more. Um, it is a very large, shrubby looking herbaceous perennial. Um, so it dies back every year, but it's a really big sort of shrub. Uh, it takes up a lot of space in a garden, uh, but it looks very much like this partridge pea, except upscaled. <laughs> Yellow flowers, uh, really neat sort of anchor plant in the garden. I have this uh, wild blue indigo, Baptisia. So this wild blue indigo is not locally native to me. It is native to the mid-Atlantic. Uh, so um, a little farther north than its native range, um, but it is a very nice plant <laughs> nonetheless. So I have, have, have what I'm working on is a hedge. Um, these are tall, uh, four feet. Again, they are herbaceous perennials, but they have a shrub habit. So once they grow in, um, they grow quickly and they get very big and bushy. So about as wide as they get tall. They have these beautiful spikes of purple flowers on them. Um, just really, really a very striking plant. Uh, and this one is uh, actually a local native plant. Um, yellow, similar in shape and habit as the wild blue indigo, the small yellow wild indigo. Not soggy, but a good bit of moisture. Uh, and this one is two feet, whereas this one is like five. <laughs> or can, can get five. Um, these have long tap roots, so they don't like to be moved. Uh, they don't transplant well. So wherever you put them, uh, expect to leave them there. You do get really good seeds, uh, and then you can just germinate and put more in a different spot if you ever need to. Um, but the more mature the root systems are, the larger they will grow in uh, during the season. A couple that are familiar for me. This is a lobelia. This is a pale spiked lobelia. I have uh, both a blue lobelia and a red lobelia already. Those are just like this one. They are tall spiked plants with these flowers. Lobelia flowers all kind of look like this uh, in shape. This one is a shorter version. This gets to about two feet tall uh, and the others are like three feet, four feet tall. Um, so another lobelia for my collection. I also um, discovered uh, an annual lobelia in my garden that is just a little, it's a little short plant. It gets maybe like a foot tall. All right, so that's the lobelia. And this one, the red columbine, this is a locally native uh, columbine, uh, similar in shape to the cultivated columbine that you may be familiar with. Uh, the leaves also look similar. Um, this one likes shade. Uh, it'll grow in full sun, but it likes part shade probably the best. Medium to dry soil, not too wet. Um, this is such a striking and beautiful flower, and it is one of the earliest plants to bloom. So it's good food for the ecosystem. Um, these are some red columbine seeds that I harvested off of my current plant and I got some more. All right, let's take a look at these Joe Pye weeds. I germinated some of these last year and planted them out. So I've got some uh, out in the garden already actually out of these seed packets, but I'm gonna do some more. This spotted Joe Pye weed uh, likes more sun and more moisture. Uh, this purple Joe Pye weed uh, likes a little bit more shade uh, and it'll tolerate it a little drier. They do both look very similar. Uh, this one is taller and this one is shorter, so that's five feet and this is seven feet. I have a bunch of Monarda uh, bee balm in the garden already, but I do like to um, grow some more. This is the lavender or lilac bee balm. Uh, it is a very easy one to grow. Um, it will grow in basically any soil condition. Uh, and as long as it has some sun, uh, it'll do good for you. It's about four feet tall. 
this spotted bee balm. This also uh, is a really easy plant to grow. It is a short-lived perennial, so um, you'll get two or three years out of any particular uh, plant. Uh, it reseeds really well though, so you don't have to worry about it leaving your garden if it likes where it is. Uh, but just uh, the most striking plant and the um, insects just love it. <laughs> Just absolutely love it. Like the amount of bees and wasps and butterflies that, that is on this plant is just amazing. It's so much fun to watch. It's one of my favorites. The skull caps that I have. This one, uh, this uh, skull cap lateriflora. I already have some of this planted out in the garden. I germinated some last year. Uh, it likes full sun, it will tolerate a little shade, and it likes more moisture in its soil. But it has really small purple flowers. Um, they almost look like like little snapdragon flowers. So it also has kind of um, a warmer green foliage to it, which I think is a really nice contrast to a lot of other uh, plants. Um, and this one, um, this small skull cap, it is a very short one. It grows about four inches. It's much more prostrate to the ground, so it sort of spreads along the ground. Um, similar flower, uh, similar leaf color. Um, these are both locally native to me. Mint. I want to be able to put some mint uh, along the border between uh, my yard and the woods, as well as a couple of other places. Uh, I grew some clustered mint um, last year, which is a really nice addition to a couple of spaces, uh, and these will all tolerate a little bit of shade, which is great. This wild mint is um, what you think of a mint looking like. You've got the clustered flowers in the middle along the stem uh, and the leaves, and it is very minty smelling, uh, very high in those sort of um, oils. Uh, and also aggressive like a mint. <clears throat> the other ones can be aggressive, but not, not, quite, not quite like that. This one, the Hoary Mountain Mint, a little bit taller. Uh, again, the flowers are along the stem, uh, looking very much like uh, you would expect a mint to look. Um, the leaves on this are a little softer and a little more silvery, which is kind of neat. Uh, and these other two don't look like mint the way you usually see them. They have really, really narrow leaves and their flowers sort of more of a panicle. So um, at the top of branching stems, uh, but they all have some of that mint odor. I did want to use it to deter the deer from coming in from the woods into my yard. Um, you know, that may not work very well, but we'll see. Um, I do love mint though. Uh, you can use all of these for tea as well. So that'll be nice couple of real standouts in terms of flowers. Um, this is a spiderwort, Ohio spiderwort. It has really grassy foliage that kind of goes out at a variety of angles. Uh, and then it has these purple flowers that are very striking. The flowers only last about a day. Each individual flower lasts about a day, but you can see that it's got tons of buds on there and it just blooms forever. <laughs> I feel like it blooms a lot. Um, uh, I have some of this in my hell spot where it's very dry uh, and it does stay a little shorter. I'd like to put some more in some other places. So that is Ohio spiderwort. This is the northern blue flag iris. I have some of this also in the backyard back by my faucet. Uh, because it's nice and damp there. It likes lots of moisture. Let's flip this over for you. So sun and part shade needs moisture. It does not like dry. So if you've got a really moist spot, this is a great plant to put in there. Um, three feet tall. It looks, you know, it looks like an iris. It has long grassy iris type leaves uh, and then this beautiful delicate purple and yellow flower on it. It's just, I just love it. I, I want some more, which is why I bought some more. And this, I'm so excited about this. Um, this is a tiny plant. It only gets to be about one foot high uh, and they like to grow sort of separate of each other. They don't really clump together. So um, 
you can see pictures of it where they just sort of like uh, sprout up and you just see these pops of um, orange uh, around and this is this is a native plant for me um, I'm really excited about this one uh, this prairie lily um, there is another native lily um, that is not native to my particular location um, I think it's a little bit more west of here um, but I'd like to get it anyway because it's also pretty and while I do love planting native plants. I am not a purist. I will go outside my own local native range, um, but I do want to feed the local wildlife. So there you go. So these are real standouts in terms of flowers. So let's talk about some plants with really great leaves. This Virginia water leaf has uh, leaves that are variegated they are like a deep green with a lighter green variegation. Almost looks like a, a watermark or like there's water sitting on the leaves. Its flower is also really striking, um, smaller than it looks here. Uh, this is about two feet tall. Uh, it does, the foliage is a little lower. So I'd say the foliage is in the one foot to 18 inch range and then it sends up a spike with this little bulb on it. Not bulb. Globe. That's the word. This wild ginger um, has these heart-shaped leaves that are just super velvety, like you touch them and they're fuzzy and you just want to like lay in it. <laughs> it makes a lovely ground cover. Uh, it does have a flower. It blooms early uh, in the spring also uh, and up underneath the leaves like a tricorner hat kind of looking flower that's like a deep red uh, it doesn't stand out very much you kind of kind of you kind of have to look for it so early spring bloomer uh, it feeds you pollinators uh, and then it gives you this beautiful leaf this beautiful ground cover for the rest of the year uh, i got two packs of that and i already have some of this uh, in my yard uh, bellwort um, it has this really sort of soft dangling leaves uh, and you can see the flowers really striking as well. Also a spring bloomer. But once the flower's done, you're left with the leaves and it makes a really nice, beautiful ground color, ground cover. These are all, um, I'm all putting these up in the shade. I don't actually think any of them tolerate sun. Nope. Uh, part shade, no full sun here. Um, where was that one? May apple. Um, this one is a little bit more of a spring ephemeral uh, because it will, the foliage will not persist all the way through to the fall. It will die back kind of midsummer. Um, but it is also a very beautiful foliage plant. Uh, and then you can see it's got an early spring flower. Uh, the flowers up underneath the leaves, much like the. Um, while ginger does. I have some of this in my yard already too, and I wanted some more, so I bought some seed packets. Um, so these are really lovely foliage plants. This is the May apple. I hope I said that <laughs> before. I'm trying to remember to say all of the names of these. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up for tonight, but uh, in like a second, I'm gonna be back um, to finish to finish this out I'm a little more than halfway through. So I'll see y'all in a minute in the magic of video. Welcome back, night number two. I have to tell you that it is hard to find a quiet time when the kids are asleep, uh, when I'm not also asleep. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm back, I've done it a week later, I think. Um, so I've got my fireplace going. I have my drink and I am going to finish the rest of these, uh, finish the rest of these seeds for you. So without further ado, this evening I thought I would start you in with uh, the onions that I've gotten. Um, these are all native to the United States. Uh, this one, Canadense, uh, is native to my local area. Uh, here in New England. And these other three 
are native to the Midwest, prairie, heartland areas of the country. So not locally native to me, but I'm gonna use them anyway. Um, I've chosen these because uh, I want to try to see if they'll help keep the deer out of the flower beds. We'll see, I don't know. They're also very pretty and they have sort of grassy foliage. Um, which is a little different from a lot of the other things that I have. So I'm going to try that out. Um, so let me tell you a little bit. Um, this one, the wild showy garlic, um, it likes sun. They all like sun. They all like full sun. Put them in full sun, they'll love it. Um, but this one only likes sun. It does not like any shade. Uh, the other ones like a little bit of shade. This one, the nodding onion will do well in a little shade. Um, the prairie onion will do well in a little bit more shade. Um, and this um, wild garlic will uh, also grow in deeper shade. Uh, so they all like dry conditions, um, dry to moist. They don't want to be sitting in water. You can see from the package front uh, that they have these really beautiful um, sort of ball-shaped, globe-shaped purple flowers. Um, the nodding onion, it hangs a little bit more, um, but they're all gonna be fairly similar to each other in look. They're all a little bit different. I'll put a picture up of this one for you. Uh, they're all a little bit different in terms of height. So that gives me a little bit of variety. Um, so this is 18 inches. That's the nodding onion. Um, this one is one foot, that's 12 inches. Uh, and this one is 14 inches. Uh, so they'll be a little bit different. They'll have a little bit of variety. So we'll see what that's like. I think that'll be really pretty. Those will be really pretty all together. Here we have um, some Pinstamen. Uh, I have Pinstamen digitalis and I also have um, Pinstamen hirsutus. So this is the northern northeastern beard tongue. Uh, and this is the foxglove beard tongue. Uh, these are locally native to my area and they were actually collected locally uh, and distributed by my very nice local native plant group. Um, some of these I helped clean, actually this is my, this is my terrible handwriting. <laughs> uh, I helped clean and uh, put these in packages for people. They are short-lived perennials, uh, but they seed pretty well. Um, they like full sun and part shade. They like basically any conditions, uh, wet conditions, dry conditions in the middle. Um, they're fairly easy plants to grow. Uh, so there's a like a basil rosette of leaves at the bottom and then it sends up a, a shoot, a spike with the flowers on it. Uh, those leaves at the bottom have uh, continued to persist throughout the winter. So even after it's snowed, I go and I look at where they were, I can still see some of their leaves. Um, and they're still a little bit green and they're there. These are all annuals, okay? 100% unfamiliar to me uh, and probably are also to you. So let me tell you about them. The Slender False Foxglove. Um, like I said before, it's an annual plant. It likes full and part shade. Um, and it likes any condition, dry, medium, moist, uh, but not wet, outstanding water. Uh, it gets to be about two feet tall. Uh, it has sort of um, really slender leaves that are short and um, sort of stems. The, the foliage seems a little sparse and then you get these big, uh, these big pops of flowers. Okay, so big in terms of the scale of the plant. Um, so it looks what I would call uh, sparkly. Uh, so you see these big pops of um, pink and the buds are white uh, and it looks a little bit like fireworks going off. Pale Corydalis. Um, it has very striking pink and yellow flowers. Uh, the foliage looks a little bit like, uh, like a parsley leaf. It gets to be about two feet or so, two to three feet, um, full to part sun and uh, drier conditions. Uh, again, it is an annual. It seems a little bit wild in habit. Um, I would even say maybe weedy in habit. 
I think actually um, this one might look a little weedy in habit also. Uh, it's not a good structured bush, um, but these flowers are just amazing. And some of the other pictures I've seen online just make them like really striking flowers. The Meadow Beauty, full sun and part shade. Uh, again, drier conditions, uh, I guess to be about a foot tall. Um, this one has more prominent foliage and, and a little bit more of a upright sort of regular looking habit. The flowers are pink and yellow. You can see, maybe you can see a theme <laughs> with these. And the foliage turns a very nice red color in the fall, um, which I'm kind of excited to experience. Um, a little shorter, gets to be about a foot tall. These two are um, native anemones to me, or thimbleweeds. So we've got a, a thimbleweed and a tall thimbleweed. This one is two feet high, and this one is three, but otherwise they look very similar. Um, they have a set of basal leaves at the bottom of the plant on the ground, uh, and when they are ready to go into flower and fruit, they send up a spike which has the white flower on the top. You can see these are open a little bit more. These are a little bit more closed. Uh, other differences, um, the tall thimbleweed likes a little bit deeper shade in addition to the possible full sun. They both like dry conditions. This one doesn't, the thimbleweed doesn't like quite as much deep shade. Here we have a variety of ver veins. We have a narrow leafed ver vein uh, or verbena simplex. We have a blue ver vein or verbena hastata. Uh, and we have a white ver vein. Verbena uticifolia, <laughs> uticifolia. Um, who's good at these Latin names? I don't even know. Um, it's worth trying out though. Always try them out. You don't get better unless you try out saying them. Uh, so um, one, so this one, the narrow leafed vervain is a little shorter, two feet tall, uh, full sun, dry. Um, it sends up white, these spikes of sort of white and purpley flowers. Um, and the leaves are narrow, if you can believe it by its name. Um, the blue vervain has these spikes of purple flowers. Uh, it gets to be about five feet. Uh, it's likes full sun and will tolerate some shade. Um, and it likes a little bit more wet conditions. The white vervain um, likes full sun all the way through to shade uh, and more medium conditions. So you're not gonna plant these all in the same place, right? Uh, oh, this white vervain also has a little bit more of an open habit instead of a single spike. You have these extra clumps of spikes coming off out the center. It just looks a little bit more open and airy. So these are all locally native to me. Uh, they will go in different places in my garden. I'm not going to plant them um, together and since their conditions, the conditions they want are different. Okay, my hibiscus. This is a um, native to my location um, hibiscus. Rose Mallow is the common name. It has a giant hibiscus flower. It'll grow very tall, almost like it's a shrub, six feet uh, or more, uh, likes a more wet location, full sun, um, will tolerate some shade, but not a lot. The flowers on this are just absolutely amazing, and they look like something tropical, something that shouldn't be native to New England, <laughs> where it's cold. They're just a glorious, they're glorious things to behold. It dies back all the way down in the winter, uh, and then re-sprouts and does all that growing. It's a very fast grower. I have a couple of these in the garden already. Um, I did not get them in early enough from last year's winter sow to see them flower, but this year, man, I'm really looking forward to it. So you should be looking forward to that too. Let's talk about Culliver's Root. I was going to show you this in the vervain group, even though it's not a vervain. It does have a somewhat similar appearance. Uh, it sends up a spike of flowers that's about five feet tall. It likes full sun and a little bit of shade and sort of medium conditions, but you can see it's got spikes, um, sort of in a similar habit to the vervain. So I'm probably gonna plant this with one of those other ones, uh, maybe the purple. This is new to me. Uh, and native to my area. 
another one that is tall and spiky. Well, not tall. This, these aren't tall. Um, about two feet. These are wild lupins. These are our native lupin. They have a similar look. The, they do have more leaves around their sort of sundial. Um, this one is sometimes called sundial lupin. And the spikes of purple flowers that would be familiar. Um, it grows a little lower than the um, non-native lupins and it likes drier conditions and well-draining soil. They're a little bit more finicky so you really have to give them somewhere that the soil is going to drain uh, or they won't really like it so much. Um, full sun would be my recommendation for these even though uh, supposedly they tolerate some shade um, but that would be my recommendation but I'm excited. I'm excited to do it. Let's talk about the golden alexander. Um, it is a yellow flower. Uh, it is in the carrot family, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I tried I tried with these last year and they didn't germinate in my winter, so I was really sad um, because my husband loves um, swallowtail butterflies and swallowtail butterflies love golden alexander. Um, it is one of the native plants that those um, butterflies like. You might have heard about them liking your carrots or your dill, but this is one of their native uh, host plants. So I'm excited about growing more of these. Um, about three feet tall, they have sort of a shrubby look uh, or a mounding habit. Um, a variety of conditions, full and part shade. Um, looking forward to this. I really want to get some of these to grow for me this year. Let's talk about the wild geraniums. These are um, geraniums that are uh, locally native. This wild geranium or maculatum, that's how you say it, and this other one, this is a uh, geranium carolinium. Uh, they are shorter plants. This one I think is one foot high and that's what we're, ta we're talking about when it's in flower. It gets a little bit higher. It's sort of a spreading foliage, ground cover type plant. Um, this is the wild geranium. Um, it is an early bloomer. These are early bloomers, so they're good for, that's good for those early pollinators. The Carolina cranes bill or the Carolina geranium uh, likes uh, full sun, so no shade and also dry conditions. So you want to get that out in the sun. Uh, I bought two packs of these. Uh, they both work pretty well in terms of their foliage being sort of a nice ground cover. Uh, even after they're done blooming, they have these beautiful pink flowers. Um, but the foliage is just lovely and they just sort of spread along the ground. So excited for those. So let's talk some more about uh, some other small plants that bloom early. Um, this one, the violet wood sorrel, is an oxalis. Um, it is related to the uh, also native uh, common yellow wood sorrel. It is small. It has sort of clover-like leaves, uh, and it is just the most delicate little looking plant. Uh, I'm excited to have some more of these. The um, yellow wood sorrel, I think, is an annual. Uh, and this is not, this is a perennial. Full part shade uh, and drier conditions, and it's a long bloomer. I was um, uh, down in North Carolina recently um, for Thanksgiving, and uh, there were some just around where we were staying, and they were just still blooming. I uh, may not get it to bloom quite that long here, <laughs> but um, I think it might bloom longer than June. We'll see. That's the wood sorrel. This is a spring beauty. This is a spring ephemeral. So it is one of the earliest to come up um, before the deciduous trees get their leaves. Um, also a small, this is a five inch plant. So it's small, um, like it comes up when your crocuses come up. It likes deep shade and it likes more moist conditions. Um, and it has these beautiful two little pink paired um, flowers. It'll go really well, I think, with some of the other spring ephemerals that I have. Sharp lobed hepatica um, is also uh, a, a small stature plant. It's uh, eight inches high. It's an early bloomer. I don't know that I would call this a an ephemeral because the leaves will continue to persist throughout the year, um, but the flowers are early and then fade away. Um, 
the way ephemerals do. And then this early buttercup, nine inches tall. Uh, again, April and May blooming. Uh, it's yellow, whereas these others that I've just shown you are sort of pink and white, um, purpley kind of flowers. So this one's yellow, so it'll be very different in terms of color. Full sun, part shade. This is not the same buttercup that takes over your fields and your lawns. This is a different kind of buttercup. This is much more rare. Uh, those ones that you think of when you think of a buttercup, um, those are non-native uh, and actually quite aggressive and invasive in the United States. So this is related, but it is a native one to here. White yarrow or Achillea nilfolium. This is one native plant that most of us are familiar with as gardeners. Full sun, part shade, just about any kind of water condition. Uh, I got these because I want to put them in a very dry area. They have sort of ferny foliage um, and they keep a nice basil rosette at the bottom throughout the year and they send up a spike of flowers that look like a white umbrella. I uh, have some already and I want to have some more. So there you go. This is the free seed packet that I got from Prairie Moon Nursery when I ordered all of these. This is the purple prairie clover. It is not native to my region. It is more of a prairie Midwestern heartland um, plant, but I may put it in somewhere. Um, as far as I can tell, it is not uh, aggressive, but I will look that up. Some clovers are. So this Clover has sort of a more of a thread leaf appearance or a narrow leaf appearance and the flowers you can actually you can see here they have this sort of spike that comes up and then the flowers all open up from the bottom so a little different from your common clover. Uh, it's also taller, gets to be about two foot height and has kind of a bushy appearance um, so a mounding sort of habit. Full partial sun and drier to medium conditions are just fine. Um, I have always thought that these flowers look like little fairy dresses <laughs> with like a sort of like a, a bodice and a like a tutu, like little ballerina fairies. Um, anyway, that's the uh, free seed that I got. All right, we're getting down towards the end. This is what I have left to show you. So it's not a full table full anymore so we've got just a couple just a couple piles left to go all right i got a nice stack here for you so these are all early bloomers starting in april some are just april and may some go through the spring to june they are also all great foliage plants uh, and their flowers are all sort of white yellowy greeny uh, and fairly delicate, actually, some of them. So this one is the bishop's cap. It is the shortest of the group I'm about to show you at one foot. Uh, it has um, foliage that is um, low to the ground, probably within six inches of the ground, and then sends up these little sort of bell or cap looking flowers up on sort of spikes. This is the early meadow rue. Uh, it is a little taller uh, than the bishop's cap uh, at two feet. Also has very nice delicate foliage, uh, has sort of a mounding habit uh, with whitish, creamish uh, colored flowers in the early spring. Uh, it likes shade and as long as the conditions aren't too extreme in terms of water, it will be fine. Solomon's Plume has very large leaves uh, and along a single stalk and then it has a sort of a spike of white flowers on the tip. Similar in look to Solomon Seal, which I also have some of, but on that arching, so on Solomon Seal, the, you've got the arch of the single stem with all the foliage on it and then the little flowers hang down underneath it. This one has a stem that arches and then the flowers are along the tip. Red Baneberry, again, has really nice foliage. The foliage on this one looks a little bit more, uh, a little bit warmer in color of green. So sort of a yellowy green, which would be nice in contrast. It has a, a set of flowers that come up, like a, like a puff of white at the, at the tip here. Uh, and the foliage layer does get to be about two feet high and then the spike is just above it. So maybe 18 inches on the foliage and then the flower spike. These red berries will persist 
uh, throughout the year. Uh, birds love them. Mammals do not. They're actually toxic to mammals. They are toxic to humans, as are many of the plants uh, that we grow in our gardens. Just, just to be aware. This one, the blue cohosh, has very delicate looking leaf and very small, delicate, sort of yellowy, creamy colored flowers. And then they get a blueberry on them uh, after they have finished flowering and have been pollinated. Uh, again, shade uh, and moist to medium soil, medium wet soil. Next grouping, these are uh, May bloomers. Uh, May through spring or summer. First we have the Seneca snake root. Uh, this is a short plant, um, 16 inches tall. Uh, it likes full sun and partial shade and then medium to medium dry conditions. Um, it has sort of a narrower leaf uh, and then it sends up this spike of um, white flowers. The Sweet Sicily is a really wonderful foliage plant. Uh, again, slightly warmer on the green tones, which is nice. And it really only likes deep shade, which is great because I have some deep shade. Um, a range of conditions from medium dry to medium wet. And it gets to be about two feet tall. You can't really tell from this picture, but it has these sort of tiny sprays of white flowers at the top uh, of this stem. And then this is the Black Cohosh. Uh, it is a very tall plant. Uh, topping out at around seven feet. I have seen places that say it gets taller than that. Again, uh, it's a part shade to shade um, plant and has um, likes more wet conditions, so medium wet to medium. Um, blooms straight on through into the fall. Uh, starts in May though, so it's nice for those early pollinators. Um, as you can see in the picture, uh, it grows straight and at the top of the stem it gets these really giant, uh, giant as in tall, uh, taller than my head, um, spikes of white flowers. It looks like it's going to be a prairie plant that likes full sun, um, but uh, it isn't. It likes the shade. I might plant this with one of those vervains that uh, likes the shade. I think those would be pretty together. The spikenard. Um, again, this is another really nice uh, foliage plant. Uh, it is a perennial in that it does die back every year, but it sort of grows and looks like a, like a large, like a medium sized woody shrub, about four feet in height, likes uh, part shade and shade, um, medium wet to medium soil, starts blooming it around July uh, and into August. So this is a midsummer, late summer bloomer. You can see the flowers here. Uh, sort of flower on the end of what looks like a really woody stem. Um, I've seen pictures of it online. It does really look like it's a shrub. I would I would m have mistaken it for for a shrub or a small understory tree. I personally just like I like the name Spikenard. I think that's um, I don't know. It has a it has a sound that I dig. Um, but it likes the shade, and I'm looking for shade things. So there you go. These are our summer bloomers. So uh, this woodland knotweed uh, blooms from July through October, so summer into fall. It's about two feet high. It likes part shade, and um, as long as it's not too extreme, either dry or wet, it is fine. This is uh, what I like to think of as a foliage plant. Uh, lots of big, large leaves, um, and then as you can see here, it has a little spike of white flowers. Uh, also called jump seed. Uh, I am not pronouncing most of these names because I don't know how, um, but if you are going to look these up, do not use the common names. Do not look up woodland, not weed. Look up this um, Persicaria virginiana. That was my best attempt there. I got two packets of these because I think they'll go. Um, I think they'll go nicely in one particular spot. <clears throat> This is the white snake root. Um, this one likes a little bit more sun, sun, part shade. Um, again, it's a nice foliage, foliage plant, <clears throat> has sort of brought more broad leaves, uh, about four feet tall and has these really, um, again, this is one that I would call sparkly, even though it's sort of like a clump of sparkles, it kind of looks like fireworks. If you look at like a field at it from a distance, pretty neat. Okay. <clears throat> 
and the lion's foot. Again, this is a tall, sort of upright plant, four feet tall. Um, this one, the other two had sort of white flowers. This one has sort of pinkish flowers um, when they open, uh, but when they're not open, they sort of dangle down like this uh, in, in clusters. It's really sort of dramatic looking uh, up at the top of their stems. These, uh, this last grouping, um, not just these, but the ones I started that were spring bloomers, um, those are all locally native to me. Uh, I have not grown any of them. I don't have a whole lot of familiarity with other people growing them. I'm just really trying them out to see what they're like. <sighs> this group here, these are some that I am a little bit more familiar with, as are maybe some of you. This is purple coneflower. Um, I collected these seeds out of my own garden. This purple coneflower, or echinacea, is not uh, locally native to New England. Um, it is a prairie plant, so more um, Midwest heartland. Full sun, part shade, um, tolerates a variety of conditions. Um, you have probably seen it. You may have it in your own garden. The bees do enjoy it. Um, I try to keep, well, it does really like, it, it does do well in the dry conditions, and I've got some of those, um, which is sort of where I have the plant in my own garden. Um, even though it doesn't get as tall in dry conditions. That's what I've noticed. Anyway, echinacea or purple coneflower. This um, Hellenium autumnale, uh, full sun, part shade. It likes more wo moist conditions. Um, this is a sneezeweed. So it's yellow uh, with radiant, sort of radiating petals, about two feet tall. I think it might get a little taller or stay a little shorter depending on its conditions. Um, I germinated some last year, but really only got one plant uh, out of all of those that I could use. So I'm going to do some more this year. Another yellow plant with sort of ray petals. This is a Coreopsis tripteris or tall Coreopsis. So it's got a yellow flower, um, full sun to part shade, a variety of conditions, as long as it's not too extreme. So we're down to the end here. Gentle viewers, thank you for coming along on this wild ride with me. So what we have left here are vines, vining plants and uh, shrubs and trees. Uh, so we will get to that, but I'm going to first, I'm gonna put a log on the fire so we can get some nice flames for you to watch. There you go. How's that for flames? <laughs> that one log is going to be gone in a minute. Okay, so these are my vines. I got this um, purple passion flower vine or passiflora in Canada. Uh, it is not native to my area. It is na native further south, um, but I'm going to try it out anyway. I, I don't even know if it will last the winter here. Uh, it's supposed to, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Many of you may be familiar with the passion flower. It's um, sort of uh, one of those native plants, native to the US plants that um, does get used in gardens. So these next two, these are both native clematis. Um, this one is the purple clematis. Uh, as you can see, it has these sort of hanging purple flowers. I already have a cultivated purple clematis uh, and I thought I would plant this one there with it as well. Um, this one likes a little bit more dry conditions than my other, my non-native clematis, so we'll see. Um, full sun, part shade, um, grows, this says about six feet high, uh, six feet, but, you know, it's a vine, it grows. <laughs> um, this one is the Virgin's Bower, or Clematis virginiana. Um, this looks a lot like uh, the invasive Sweet Autumn Virgin's Bower. Um, it is not the same though. <clears throat> this one is not nearly as aggressive as that one. Uh, and uh, even if it was as aggressive, it is native to my area. It is native to uh, much of the United States, I believe. Full sun, part shade, um, medium wet to medium, uh, and grows to about nine feet. So you do need things for it to climb on. Uh, unlike the invasive, non-native um, Virgin's Bower, the Sweet Autumn, this one does not have a heavy fragrance. So if you're looking for that, this one's not the one for you. However, if you do have 
Um, if you do have a Sweet Autumn Virgin's Bower, please yank it out and get something different uh, because it is really, really invasive, even though it just smells so nice. Um, it's hard to do sometimes. Shrubs. So this New Jersey tea is a woody shrub. Uh, it is about three feet tall, so it's sort of a short mounding shrub. Uh, it likes full sun, it likes medium to drier conditions and blooms starting in June through August. Nice foliage on this, a nice sort of big leaf, uh, so good structure, mounding habit. Uh, and these flowers, so you can see like sort of what the flowers look like close up here, little sprays of flowers. Um, but from a distance, the flower clusters remind me of um, almost a crepe myrtle um, or a lilac. So they sort of have that sort of cone shape uh, at the end of each sort of branch. Um, I think it's a really beautiful plant. Uh, apparently you can turn the leaf, you can make the leaves uh, into a tea which is nice. I'll be keen to try that out. Okay. And these are my roses. Uh, if you've watched other videos, you will have seen um, a little bit about these already when I soaked, did the soak before I um, put them aside to germinate. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so these are native roses. They are both locally native to me. Uh, the flowers look very similar. You have uh, pink petals that go around the outside with red, uh, sorry, yellow centers. It looks like a rose. These are uh, sort of bushy in habit. Um, this one stays a little smaller. This is the pasture rose or uh, Rosa Carolina. This one is the early wild rose or Rosa Blanda. Um, one of these has less thorns on it and I think that it is the Rosa Carolina. So I'm excited about these. They have a really nice fragrance, um, not too strong, uh, full, full sun, part shade, um, will tolerate dry conditions. Uh, I'm looking forward to actually figuring out where I'm gonna plant these if I get any of them to germinate. Um, so that's the Rosa Blanda and the Rosa Carolina. We do have, uh, we do have one other native rose uh, here. It's the Rosa Virginiana. I already have one of those in my yard. You may have seen um, some roses on it. Uh, also a uh, pink petaled rose with a yellow center, that Rosa Virginiana. Two elderberries. I have a um, Sambucus canadensis, that's the black elderberry. Uh, and I have a Sambucus racimosa. Uh, or the red-berried elderberry. Um, they both have white flowers. This, uh, the, el the black elderberry sort of has like an umbrella-shaped grouping of flowers, whereas the red elderberry has more of a um, sort of an oval spike of flowers. Both are small trees or large sh shrubs. They like, um, let's see, the elderberry likes full sun uh, and the red elderberry likes more shade. Um, they both like about the same kind of moisture. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, the red elderberry is a little bigger in size. Uh, but they both get pretty big for large shrubs. This is Round a leafed dogwood. dogwood. Uh, a dogwood that I don't already have, that hasn't already volunteered in my yard. Um, so it's a small understory tree, uh, height about 10 feet. It looks like a dogwood. The flowers do not look like your classic dogwood flower. Um, they are tiny flowers that are uh, bunched together in clumps or tufts. Okay, these last two are trees, proper trees. Uh, they both get up to about 20 feet in height. Um, that depends on the conditions to some degree. <clears throat> this one is a bladder nut. Um, it likes shade, part shade, deep shade, uh, medium moisture, and it is an early bloomer. The blooms are sort of inconspicuous. They like hang down right underneath the branch, uh, but you, clearly you can see that the fruit uh, is very conspicuous and has um, sort of a really interesting look to it. <clears throat> uh, and then we have the wafer ash. Uh, this one is, um, let me move that clip for you. This wafer ash is uh, a citrus. It's in the citrus family. 
Uh, it is the northernmost growing citrus in the United States. Um, part shade, uh, dry soil, early bloomer, 20 feet high. Uh, it's um, fruit uh, are these sort of like round um, coin looking things, pretty neat looking. Again, a proper tree, 20 foot high. So, thank you for staying through to the end of this video. I know it has been a long one. It has been a lot of unfamiliar plants uh, to me and probably to you. Um, but you can see what we tackled in this particular video, all of these, uh, all of these here, this is the full box. So these are some um, non-native plants. Uh, I showed you that in the previous video. Um, I am really excited about all of these and I will feature them more uh, in other videos as we get growing uh, and as I gain more familiarity. Um, I do have a uh, garden tour, a winter garden tour video coming up where uh, I want to do a little bit something different um, in terms of the plan for the garden in addition to some nice outdoor scenes. Um, but you will see some of these feature in that as I give you sort of an idea of where I'm gonna put them in the garden. So keep an eye out for that. And I just wanted to give a hearty thank you to the 40 people who have subscribed and all of the people who watch these videos. I think that you are all amazing uh, for coming back and checking these things out. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed the fireplace. Um, I have basically finished my glass of whiskey uh, and um, it is late and I am going to go to bed. So have a nice night everyone and thank you for watching.